Thank you uh, for joining the session, uh, and thank you for making it to the end of the day, last session of the day. Right? They're they're always rough. They're always rough. So uh, it's been a it's been a great, great, great event today. So I've been really enjoying it. So, uh, but once again, thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Josh Carlisle. I am a principal engineer at Zscaler, uh, and also on the community side, I'm a Microsoft MVP, and I am also here with my colleague Nita Rafi, and I'm a uh, staff software engineer at Zscaler. Uh, work with Josh. Yeah, so we're colleagues and we work together and you're going to find out over the next 30 minutes what we have been working on. Uh, um, so to get started here a little bit, uh, a little bit of our agenda here. Uh, so uh, we're going to give a little bit of a platform overview about what our world looks like because we want to give this a little bit of a context, right? Uh, so that you understand a little bit more about our solution. And, go. and uh, we're also going to kind of cover some of our uh, you know, buy versus build, some of our considerations we made and a little bit of what our journey was like that led us to some of the decisions we made and where we landed on things. Uh, and then we're going to jump into a actual demo. You're going to see a, a, a abbreviated version of kind of what our environment looks like, a, a little bit of an easier to consume version uh, that represents kind of where we landed on things. And, and, uh, and then finally, we're going to be covering some best practices and some lessons learned, right? No, nothing's perfect. And there's always hiccups along the way. So we're going to kind of be sharing a bit about what we learned and, and what worked well for us. So to give you a little bit of context before we get started, uh, 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 both Nita and I work on a product at Zscaler called Zscaler Posture Control. Uh, it is part of a category of applications commonly referred to as CNAP. Uh, uh, and for those folks who aren't aware of all the latest and greatest Gartner acronyms, <laughs> it stands for Cloud Native Application Protection Platform, which is kind of a mouthful. Uh, uh, but in essence, we help our customers secure their cloud native applications. Uh, uh, and we do that in a kind of in a very specific way. So like most SaaS platforms out here, we have customers. And this is a little bit of a, a difference when we talk about tenants in our use case. It's a little bit different than what uh, other talks may have been talking about when we're talking about tenants. We have tenants in the traditional uh, uh, conversation uh, 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 definition where, uh, where we have a platform that we offer out to our developer and feature and engineering team, something we call subsystems internally. Uh, but we also have tenants as in actual customers, right? So the, the different spin on this is that in our use case, our multi-tenant use case, it's actually multi-tenant of multi-tenants. Uh, and that adds a little bit of a different spin on some of the complexities and some of the challenges we had uh, along our way in our journey. So we have our customers, and, and those customers, like most customers, are running cloud native applications today. Uh, they're living in Azure and AWS and GCP, right? Uh, and they're also using sets of tools uh, to both build those applications, deploy those applications, uh, define those applications in the case of IAC. Uh, and all of those uh, uh, platforms provide telemetry to us, right? And what our platform does is we essentially correlate and make sense out of all that telemetry coming in to help customers understand when they have misconfigurations that can lead to security problems, when they have vulnerabilities, maybe a, a, a pack, oops, did we lose? There we go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> that was weird. Uh, uh, when we have a uh, uh, um, vulnerabilities, for example, if there's a package that a particular service is using uh, that has an exploit, and we correlate it all together and help customers make their applications more secure. So that's kind of the context that we live in. We consume lots and lots and lots of data uh, as part of that. So what does this look like from a deployment standpoint? And, and where does this multi-tenant of multi-tenant start to kind of tie in? Well. This was a Greenfield project about 18 months ago, uh, and, and that's both a blessing and a curse. Uh, we had a lot of freedom, but we had a lot of decisions that we needed to make along the way. And we secure cloud native applications, so it makes sense that we should probably be a cloud native application ourselves, right? Uh, so we have a lot of the traditional components that you expect from a cloud native, cloud -native application. We live in the cloud. We are uh, living in Kubernetes. We have microservices and messaging infrastructure that we host and database infrastructure and a lot of other platform components, uh, many of which are CNCF projects. We use OpenTelemetry, we use Kata, uh, uh, we use just a lot of other CNCF projects to kind of help stitch together our platform. Uh, uh, and from a traditional 
uh, multi-tenant standpoint, we have multiple environments, right? And those multiple environments are deployed to what we call stamps or regions around the world. What makes things a little bit more challenging is that we also have customer-specific microservices and customer-specific components. Uh, when you're in a multi-tenant environment from a customer perspective, you have some challenges, things like noisy neighbors that you have to solve, noisy neighbor, no, noisy neighbor problems, things like uh, uh, customer data isolation, customer isolation. And some of, those, uh, some of those problems and the way in which you solve them add a lot of complexity on how you deploy applications. So we have tenant-specific microservices. Microservices are just dedicated to tenants. It's worth mentioning we use another CNCF project I mentioned a minute ago called Cata that allows us to do that in a cost-effective way so when nothing's running, we don't pay for it. Uh, 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 kind of like a scale to zero, a little serverless kind of model. Uh, but we also have things like customer-specific topics and customer-specific databases. And we have to be able to kind of manage those kind of things. So. When we started kind of coming up with, you know, how do we handle, what do we want to do? How do we want to approach this? Remember, we're green field here, right? We kind of started making some decisions. We tried to start thinking about, you know, do we want to build our own? You know, are we that special, right? Everybody thinks we're special. Everybody, every product's unique. But do we decide, hey, do we want to build this ourselves? Do we want to use a traditional deployment platform? Uh, uh, you know, things like GitHub Actions or, you know, Azure DevOps, things that, you, that, that, that are traditional out there. Or do we want to maybe embrace a few GitOps side, right? Because GitOps, cloud native, they kind of go hand in hand. So that was definitely on there. But we had some strong considerations, right? We needed to support some of the special multi-tenancy use cases we had, tenants of tenants of tenants kind of scenario. Uh, 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 we also were sensitive to not getting too early on new platforms because we wanted something that had some maturity and some long, li some long life. Uh, uh, and we also, it was very important that our engineers were comfortable with working with the platform. Uh, because a key consideration across the board was really around our, 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 our velocity, right? And if we had to introduce something really, really new to our engineers, it's gonna slow down our velocity and we wouldn't be able to meet some of our deployment goals. Uh, and then obviously cost is, is, is a determining factor. So we had some painful first steps <laughs> that we learned from. Since velocity was really our number one goal, uh, we started to align with basically do whatever you want as long as it's fast, uh, uh, which obviously has its, its pluses and negatives. Uh, uh, and since we have subsystems, which are basically teams, we said, you know, do what you need to do to deploy what you're responsible for deploying in, in the way that you feel confident doing. Uh, uh, and that worked for a while. That definitely got us through our hump. We got a first release out really quickly, a very large product in about eight months. But as we went GA, we started to kind of identify, this isn't really that great, right? This is, there, there are some pain points here. It was fragile. It was expensive. And we started kind of thinking about, how do we, how do we overcome these? And we were still a little bit in the mindset of, of do we build this ourselves? Or do we uh, 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 lean into another solution? Uh, and we started looking at things like custom resource definitions and defining our own resources. And that led us into looking a little bit closer again at GitOps. And a lot had changed in that year. Uh, uh, a lot of things had matured in that year. And so as we started to think about what's next, we started to very quickly align against GitOps. Uh, it had the maturity that we were looking for. Uh, our teams were comfortable with it because the teams are already using Git today. We're doing PRs today. It was a metaphor that they were very comfortable with. Uh, key to us, and you'll learn a little bit more as, as Nita jumps in and shows some more details about our multi-tenant approach, key to us was being able to eloquently handle that multi-tenant architecture, that, that, that tenant of tenants scenario. And what we found pretty quickly, and we, we were looking at various options, we looked at Argo, we looked at Flux, we found fairly quickly that Flux really shined in that multi-tenant scenario for us. Uh, uh, and it did it in a way that was, we felt was relatively uh, uh, simple. Uh, and simple to understand. Uh, uh, and then, of course, the Flux community is fantastic. When we had some hesitations like, oh, we're getting into something really new, right? We started reaching out to the Slack channel and a few other, at a few other locations. We were getting really great vibes from the community, a lot of support, very responsive to, to questions and answers, and we felt really comfortable about getting involved with something uh, uh, that is relatively new. So with that kind of context in mind uh, 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 about what our journey kind of looked like, some of our bumps along the lines, uh, 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 I'm going to go ahead and pass off to Nita, and she's going to kind of talk a little bit about what our solution actually looked like and some of the best practices around it. Yep. Thanks, Josh. 
Uh, and just to add to what Josh just said, it, it was not just only the Slack channel, but they had a really good examples available online from their GitHub repository that we could just take in and then customize it, uh, pun intended, customize it for, for our use case, right? So I'm just gonna start with my first example, uh, which is like a, a multi, uh, excuse me, a mono repository uh, example, right? So as our keynote speaker said this morning, Christy, that you copy, paste, and then you evaluate and then you customize, right? So that is exactly what we did. We did the, we took up their example for Mono Repository. Uh, and then, you know, what we have here is apps. Uh, These apps are customer specific apps, right? So you see on the base, we have identity subsystem, which has a bunch of microservices and so does uh, processor subsystem. Uh, uh, and then, you know, uh, each customer has their own Kafka topics and so on and so forth, right? So that's all defined here in apps. Uh, and then in infra, infra is something, you know, that's shared across all of the tenants, you know, on, on, on any particular cluster. So there, you know, we would have like whatever StreamZ operator or like, you know, Keda operator and so on and so forth, right? And that's shared across the, uh, across the tenants. That's what we define in infra. And then obviously in clusters, you know, you bootstrap your, your flux and then, you know, you point it to whatever um, uh, Kubernetes cluster you're pointing it to and in our uh, for this demo we have it in on dev and prod that they're calling it but they both are our do docker desktops running here locally on our mac just for this demo uh, and then obviously we have tenants right so this is where we thought that flux came in like to rescue us like you know and, and just instantly worked for us so these are our actual tenants right the tenants that are using our product so when we onboard them we do nothing but like you know create a pr or, or an auto commit to this repository and add a folder there and we will see a demo of that later um, but this is a repository structure pretty standard practice that flux suggests like you know to have your repository structure like that so this is what i have here and here like you know in, in here if you see underneath that cluster what i have is an infra.yaml and a tenants.yaml which is pointing to those folders in the repository right so my infra is pointing to an infra dev and then obviously you know my tenant is pointing to to tenants dev uh, and and this is if you see it is under cluster dev right and then then similarly i have underneath prod i have again the infra and prod which if you notice on line number 11 it's pointing to tenants prod uh, path which is this path so each of those environments will get the tenants that are defined in in in, in that uh, directory all right so i'm going to show you uh, how this looks on the on the cluster and again as i mentioned this is my docker desktop here uh, if i see here what are all the helm releases i have right and then you see look at look at look at the power here like you know i can customize my helm releases so i have defined them in base but then i'm applying patches and my helm releases are now customer specific i have an acme uh, uh, identity service helm release and then obviously i also have a a Contoso identity service and release, like, you know, so pretty much the same exact hand releases, but then for each of them, each of the customers. I also have here, if I look at the Kafka topics, let's see if I've gotten my Kafka topics for each of those tenants, right? So I have an Acme topic, a Contoso topic, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? And if I go take a look at my pods here, uh, this is what is really important for us because each of the tenants are running in their own namespaces, right? All of their resources are in their own namespace and right here, multi-tenancy, right? You know, they have their own service account, they have their own access to secrets and so on and so forth. Everything is locked down by their namespace. And right here, I have like those two pods for Acme. And if I go in Conto, so I have their pods in here. And obviously I'm using, again, from Flux for this demo, I'm using their pod info uh, uh, pod. So if I were to go take you on browser and, and go to one of those um, uh, ports, it is the pod info standard app running in there. Now, what I would like to ask here to Josh, like if you see here on my repository in both of these clusters, I have only two tenants, right? I have Acme and Contoso. Uh, uh, and I would like uh, Josh to merge my PR. So here I have a pre uh, canned, uh, like, you know, PR uh, up here opened against my repository, which is onboarding Aviati, uh, Aviato for, for demo. And here what I'm doing is just adding uh, a commit. To, to the Git repository and what the effect should be is I should be seeing pods for this new customer. I should see a Helm release. I should see a Kafka topic for this for this customer or our tenant. Uh, and Josh, please go yeah, ahead, so. uh, merge this PR. And I'm using the handy GitHub app here. So uh, real time here, we're gonna merge this and see if this works. Uh, All 
All right, is it? All right, successfully merged and closed. Right? Yep. All right, okay, Should let's see. Go. Yeah, let's, let's go on, on open lens and see if I've gotten a new namespace. Uh, maybe not yet. Let's, let's go ahead and take a look at the reconciliation. Uh, so if I go on the customization and uh, look at my tenant customization, let's see if it's, if it's what's the state, maybe it's reconciling. Um, and eventually, like, you know, I should have um, a new namespace and a new hand release. Uh, all right, here, here it is. So I've got my I've, I've got my new uh, tenant, my new customer here, running all of the pods that it's supposed to supposed to run. Obviously, what is defined on the base and 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 and, and in the in the dev um, uh, path for that. All right. So this is pretty straightforward, right? You know. Uh, it's, it's what Flux promises to do, and that is what it is here. But in, in reality, we have a mono repository structure, right? So we have for each of our um, for each of our um, uh, tenants or our customer apps or like you know um, their their Kafka or data requirements and so on and so forth. Like you know, we have uh, multiple repository structure in reality, and, and like you know, these are some of the best practices that we follow on top of whatever I showed you here in the demo, right? So uh, if 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 I go and take a look at all my repositories here, so the ones that are in green are the customer agnostic deployments, right? And the ones that are in yellow are customer specific deployments. So how do I make it all available uh, when Flux is reconciling, right? So we have a bunch of include there, right? And uh, everything is getting accumulated there on, on the customization. Uh, everything is, is uh, pulled in from different repositories and then pushed to the push to the cluster, right? So that is one of the uh, uh, features, standard feature from Flux that, that we use. Another is, is a Flux diff. It is a very um, powerful tool that Flux gives us. So even before I deploy or merge the PR, to see what the state would be on the cluster. We have flux diff that we run our, on our GitHub actions. And then this will tell me, oh, by the way, if you were to merge this commit, it's gonna break on the cluster for this particular reason, right? So then we go ahead and we fix our things because you know we are using flux diff as part of our continuous integration. So that's really powerful that, that, that we use. And yet another thing is um, obviously like, you know, alerts and, and, and notifications. So we have both like a, a provider for Slack and for Grafana. And here you see like, you know, uh, Flux is constantly reconciling and, and sending us notifications. And we have like um, Slack and Grafana. And we also have generic webhooks that we do certain things based on those. So we are using all of that. Uh, and also something really important for us is post build variable substitution. Like as you can see, you know, we have a bunch of clusters, like, you know, dev clusters and staging and integration in US, uh, uh, West 2 region, like and obviously we do on AWS, but then we also have on, on, in, in uh, EU central and so on and so forth, right? So here, we rely heavily on this post build uh, substitution because you know each of the environments have different uh, uh, values for for those things like you know so we obviously uh, use um, define them and then we use them depending on when we where we are sending our um, our workloads to. So that's again really one of the best practices and, and really good tool that uh, uh, customize along with Flux provides us that, 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 that we use heavily. So uh, along, with, along with like you know all of these things, uh, it is serving us really well because what happens now is I'm onboarding a tenant by uh, an automatic uh, commit, but then also I'm offboarding them when they are done using our product uh, I'm offboarding them by just sending another commit and removing that folder Aviato from my uh, repository, which Flux then reconciles because it has the the purge um, uh, set to set to true. So if you look at my tenants.yaml, here you see line number 12. Uh, excuse me, not purge, prune true, which means that if a resource isn't found on that path, it will automatically go ahead and clean up all the resources and then delete the namespace. So, you know, I, I don't have to keep notes and reminders for myself. Oh, by the way, this tenant is offboarded. Go ahead. Something wasn't deleted or like, you know, so, so nothing in there. Everything happens just automatically. With that. Yeah. And, and, and I'll add to the offboarding piece. And this is uh, 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 something that was really meaningful for us internally. And I think different folks probably had some experience uh, with traditional, like more of a more of a push kind of model. We were onboarding particular tenants. Maybe we had had a trial 
or we were doing a POV, POC with a customer, and they were ready to, to, to buy, for example, and we wanted to have a formal environment for them. Or even in dev and lower environments, we were always spinning up like you know, practice environments and test environments. Uh, uh, and then we'd offboard them, and stuff would get left behind. And they're like zombies on your, on your cluster, and, 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 except they're very expensive zombies. Uh, uh, and, and that was a big problem for us. And the desired state kind of model was really attractive, especially for offboarding, because we had a great deal of assurity that those resources would actually get cleaned up and we weren't paying for all these zombies uh, sitting around in all of our environments, especially our lower environments, uh, where developers would spin up a new tenant to test with and then spin it back down and do that 10 times a day. And each time something would go wrong and 20% of it would be left over, right? And that adds up day after day, week after week, right? And, and it also added a burden onto our DevOps team because there was always like some manual cleanup that needed to happen, right? And so this model, this multi-tenancy model, uh, 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 the multi-tenancy of multi-tenancy really, really, really helped us not only save on the complexity, but on a lot of the costs as well. Uh, so that's real, oh, go ahead, sorry. There we go. So. So let's, in the last few minutes we have here, and, and we'll leave some time for some questions as well, uh, uh, there's a few learnings that we had from this, right? Uh, 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 and no product's perfect. Uh, 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 there's always pain points, right? And, and, and these are a few of the key learnings that we had uh, coming out of this. Uh, our organization relied heavily on Helm charts, right? And, and one of the things that's super valuable, especially in production, uh, with Flux is the ability to do drift detection, right? Someone goes in, you know, and goes in and says, you know, I'm just going to delete this X resource, right? I'm going to delete whatever it may, it may be. And, and, and there's a self-repair aspect of it, right? That, that'll repair itself uh, pretty quickly. And that works as expected for typical deployments. Uh, uh, if you're deploying with the YAML, your normal manifests, uh, uh, or if you're even using uh, customize, it works as expected. One of the challenges we had is that w traditionally, and this has changed, but the Helm charts didn't have the same level of drip detection that we expected. Uh, and, and what that meant is, is that someone went in and messed with a resource. If they deleted the Helm chart, things would reconcile, it would come back. Uh, but if they deleted a resource that the Helm chart deployed, then we didn't get some of the expected behavior. Now, it's worth mentioning we were able to work around this issue with notifications and some of the different tools that we had that, that, that Nita showed you about understanding when things are happening. Uh, uh, and we were able to get around that, but it caused us a few hiccups. But luckily, there's actually uh, a, a new, and I believe it's in preview right yeah. now, it's in yeah, preview, yeah. Uh, to, to manage uh, when you're using Helm charts to do the drift detection that you expect. So even though it was a pain point for us, if this is new for your environments, it may not be a pain point for you guys. Uh, but it is, uh, we will be waiting until it goes GA, so if we have a little bit of there. The other aspect uh, uh, that caused us a few challenges is there's no real super powerful admin console, right? Uh, uh, now, once again, we were able to kind of address this by uh, spinning up some really nice uh, uh, Grafana charts. We had lots of telemetry. We had no shortage of data points coming in. We had no shortage of visibility. Uh, uh, but uh, for folks who weren't familiar with Flux and they were like, just give me a web page I can hit that shows me admin stuff, right? We didn't quite have that experience. So we had to do a little bit of work ahead of time to deliver on some full-featured Helm chart, I'm sorry, full-featured Grafana charts and some other dashboarding tools that allowed us to kind of get the visibility for the folks that needed it. Uh, the other thing we ran into is in, we're in a very large environment, uh, uh, hundreds of microservices, right? And as, as you probably noticed, uh, uh, even more so when we're doing tenant-specific, right? And what we found over time as well is that uh, we had to kind of tweak a little bit of how often we want to reconcile certain types of resources. So we want to reconcile our tenant-specific resources pretty quickly because they might be spinning up and spinning down. We deploy things like Neo4j and, 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 and Mongo and other aspects. Those we don't need to reconcile too often. If we're reconciling those too often, we're probably doing something wrong, right? So. Uh, all those reconciliations uh, uh, do cause overhead in the cluster. And, and, and these days with you know, hundreds of operators from various solutions all landing on your cluster, right? Uh, uh, we found that we needed to tweak a little bit of uh, 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 that, that, that reconciliation, how often, how frequently we want to reconcile stuff because we were adding a lot of unneeded overhead uh, uh, onto our cluster with frequent unneeded reconcile uh, cycles. Uh, the last thing, and this is more of, a, more of an interesting antidote, is uh, most people here are probably familiar with the garbage in, garbage out uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, statement. If you have 
badly defined deployments, they stand out exceedingly 10 times more when you're doing flux because every time you reconcile, it will let you know that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing uh, as opposed to what would normally take the place of manual. So uh, the quick story that, that, that we were telling is that, and lucky this was just in dev, uh, um, most folks are, are, are aware of different policies in Kubernetes around persistent storage and non-persistent storage. And if you don't define your storage with the way that you want to define your storage, it'd be maybe more persistent. Uh, uh, and someone maybe happens to in dev goes and deletes something uh, 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 and Flux will reconcile it, you will lose that storage, right? So it's not a Flux thing, but it made uh, 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 maybe some QA challenges in lower environments before you know the the manifests were fully QA'd a little bit more challenging because it, it became evident very very quickly when you have a problem right yeah, so, so garbage we, in garbage right, out or we could put it yeah. in a day but flux made us fix our deployments yeah. uh, made us like you know aware of oh we should have a, a, a volume policy attached uh, to to our volume like you know whether we want to retain it or whether we want to delete it so it brought some of the inconsistencies or some of the things that we overlooked to write on our face that, hey, we got to go fix this, so, yeah. yeah. Which is both, once again, a blessing and a kind of a yeah. curse kind of thing, right? Uh, uh, one thing I want to mention as we kind of wrap and, and, and open up uh, for, for, for any questions is uh, um, the demo that Nita did, that's all available up on uh, a GitHub repo. Uh, and yes, it's up there. The demo code is on there. You can clone that and run it. There is, we tried to make it so that you could take and apply our learnings, but didn't have all the crazy dependencies that we had, right? So you can actually pull this down and, and, and use it as is uh, and explore how we were able to do multi-tenancy of multi-tenancy uh, with some uh, uh, pretty simple use cases. We, we had a little bit of extras in there with a, a Kafka cluster and deploying topics so that you could kind of better understand some of the common dependencies that you have when you're deploying these uh, as well. Uh, but uh, a couple quick uh, resources. Obviously, one of our best experience was working with the Flux community. Uh, definitely check out uh, uh, that Flux uh, community link on there, and they'll be able to explore how to kind of reach out to the community through Slack channels and other mechanisms. Really, really helped us on our initial journey, reducing a lot of pain. Uh, and obviously, follow, if you're interested in Flux, follow that Getting Started guide. Uh, and, and, and for both Nita and myself, please reach out to us on LinkedIn. Uh, go ahead and feel free to connect with us. Uh, uh, we're happy to uh, uh, answer questions. And, uh, uh, and I think at this point in time, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, this is, this is great. We love Flux. Yeah. Yeah, it solves our problems. So yep. thank you. And, we'll, and we've got just a few minutes left for questions if, if you'd like to, uh, if there's any questions from the audience. No questions? OK, great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. I actually do have a question, but I wanted to clap, too. OK, that's awesome. <laughs> Clap clapping works, too. Yeah, fire away, please. Ooh, good question. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, what tools or how did you determine what intervals to use for your reconciliation right. after the fact? So, so we didn't use any tool, but we looked at the usage pattern, right? So for example, what are some of the things that are changing more frequently than other, right? So let's say if I have a, a microservice for a, for, a, for a tenant that is not changing as often, that can be reconciled at a, at a higher frequency, like, you know, maybe 30 minutes or 40 minutes, like, you know, I could, I could do that for, for, for that. But if there is something that is changing often, then that is like you know reconciliation uh, um, uh, faster. So for example, if I'm onboarding in Dev, I get like you know hundreds of tenants every day. So I'm reconciling my tenant, my 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 um, frequency on my uh, tenant customization is much shorter. Uh, versus like you know uh, my microservices and changing that often like you know is this just done and then and I know that uh, we are not working on it that stays longer but uh, we did not use any tool it's just like a usage pattern and uh, some of the uh, best practices from Flux uh, if I have a lot many reconciliations happening uh, I got to tweak my um, uh, controller 
um, source controller or, or, or uh, customized controller. So I just practice like you know the best practices for the documentation, and then I just uh, make sure I'm running the right number of threads for. That. So for your infrastructure stuff, it's yep. going to be like quite a long reconciliation yes. versus your apps. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Right. And and what we are thinking uh, as as we are learning from it, maybe instead of doing all of the infra together in one customization, maybe we can break it. Uh, so, so some of the things like you know that we want to reconciliation uh, often, that can be uh, as part of one customization, and and something that is like you know kind of be there like you know happy go lucky stays there forever could be another customization. Same is for tenants like you know I could have uh, right now I just showed like one customization for the entire tenant directory. I could have it like you know do it by uh, maybe. Um, what are the customers that are paying me money, more money? What are my, my bigger customer? They get reconciliation uh, faster than my other customers. So things like that. Yeah. And it's, it's important to know that too, from the standpoint of like, you're gonna know that you need to do this because you're like, why am I keeping on having to increase my resources and sources over and over again, right? And, and to a certain extent you run into, you, there's a potential to run into kind of like a deadlock scenario, right? Because reconciliations, you know, the, 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 because of the frequency of them. So the trigger was is we were looking at resource utilization of all of our operators, on, on, you know, and, and it, there's so many operators from these days, right, that, that we were like, okay, we, we probably need to do something better about this. And I think the key thing, too, is, is keep it simple at first. I think you've probably heard that in a lot of conversations and a lot of presentations is, is iteration is the key. Uh, you can absolutely overthink this. And you can over-architect this, and it's easy to do. You can come up with some crazy directory structures, and you can go the other end of, we had a mono repo for the demo, and then for something very simple and straightforward, you know, you have 10 repos, right, uh, breaking things out. And so uh, keep it simple, uh, uh, and watch the telemetry, and it will guide you on kind of what direction you need to grow. Watch, you know, uh, how the, the patterns that the developers are doing PRs on, right? What are they triggering? So on and so forth. And, and the nice thing is, and once again, we had a really good experience with working with Flux. It was super flexible to allow us to evolve. It mm -hmm. wasn't a big deal to go, okay, we need a little bit more structure here or here, let's pull this out, put it in a different repo. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a scary thing uh, to be able to do that. Yeah. And another thing is also what it does good for us is the dependency management. So if I know that if my Helm chart A needs uh, B and C and D before, it can uh, reconcile that, right? So I can do that on my Helm release, uh, show, throw in the dependencies that it needs. And what it means that Flux will only make sure that those dependencies are available before it reconciles that chart again, right? So I'm defining those for my Helm releases so it is not constantly like, you know, yeah. Um, so we don't have a we don't want a scenario where we're spinning up a service that uses a topic that hasn't been created yet. Yeah. Or you referencing a database that hasn't been created yet, things like that. So but good question, good question. Um, any other questions? Anything from anything from Flux creators. Are we doing things right? Is there anything we can improve? For Flux creators, did we just scare you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, so I guess right now, you know, uh, we have maybe like a bunch of customers, right? Yeah. But we, we, are, we are definitely uh, looking into seeing, you know, once we have like customers in thousands, how, how, how are we going to scale our, our Flux controllers? Like, and obviously we're gonna have some, uh, oh my gosh, kind of moments, and we will reach out to you, yeah. and obviously we're gonna fine tune our, our controllers to, to yeah. see. And we're gonna iterate, right? We're gonna learn. We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna learn and hopefully yeah. we'll come back here and maybe maybe next year and say, this is what happened when we had 5,000 customers, right? And this is what we did. It's uh, a good place so to have 5,000 customers. It's, so a yes, yeah, it's a good problem to have, problem right? To have, it's a good yeah. problem to have. But we're pretty confident in where we landed in this, and we're having uh, some really, really good early and midterm successes on this. Uh, our developers are happy with it. We feel like we're getting the velocity that we want from it. So uh, we're, we're, we're pretty happy with where we landed, but we know we're going to learn, we're going to grow, we're going to probably make some mistakes, and, and, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll share those and what we did for them. So. Yes. Which, say that again. Sharding, sharding support. No, no, no. Have you seen the new sharding support? No, no. I have not. No. You should check it out. All right. Okay. 
All right. Thank you for giving us a good homework. Yes, we have some homework now, sharding Amazing. support. Absolutely. Where would we improve with that? What would we improve? Uh, what, you can, what you can do is if your um, flux controllers are bottlenecking because you have too many, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to need this before you hit five or 10,000 uh, customers Probably. because we have a couple of people who said this is a blocker for us. Okay. Uh, so it was um, sort of fast tracked into the GA. Uh, so it's in, uh, I think we have 2.0.0 RC.2 now. Um, so you can you can check it out and see if it uh, solves a problem for you. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And and please mention your name. Oh, I'm Kingdon. I'm a Flux maintainer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. You're on record now. <laughs> so, but thank you so much. I hope everybody. I know this is the last show of the day, but uh, I hope everybody is not. There's more. Okay. There's more. Sorry. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Thanks. We're still we're still going. Okay. Well, enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.